little bird the cyber weighed only 60 pounds but every night before she slept she bounced plumb off the ground and she cried when she tried to sleep that's when that white fuzzy spirit started to creep so there she lay when people came to watch that child's bed hop bouncing bertha was her name Many ways, the Seibert family were your typical mountain folks. After all, their great-grandparents were among the first original white pioneers to settle the Jonesville, Virginia area, situated along the Daniel Boone Wilderness Trail in the late 1700s. The couple built their picturesque cabin high atop Powell Mountain in the upper end of Wallens Creek and began raising corn on the rocky soil. The steep climb to the homestead was enough to make the most rugged mountain man double over from exhaustion on his way to the top. However, the view from the mountain summit was spectacular, and on a clear day, you could see the mighty blue waters of the Powell River shimmering below in the distance. Yet, the Seibert family weren't the only family to call this place home. They soon discovered an old lady that lived on the opposite side of the mountain that most folks called Granny Moses. At first, they seemed to coexist together just fine. But the Cyberts began to notice that year after year, for some strange reason, the old woman never grew any crops. Heck, she didn't keep any chickens or livestock either. She was rarely even seen, except a few times in the shadows, picking wild herbs from the forest. With the Cyberts family growing, they decided they'd begin farming on Granny Moses' side of the mountain. And the crop turned out to be one of the biggest crops they had ever produced on this mountain. And one morning, as several of the Seibert family members were loading corn onto a sled tied behind their mule, Granny Moses appeared from the midst of the cornfield. This was literally the first time they'd ever seen the woman face to face. Grandpap Seibert called out, Howdy, ma'am. How goes it? The old woman replied with dead silence as her eyes shifted slowly from each member of the Seibert family with a glare so deep it seemed to peer to each person's soul. Mighty kind of you to let us raise a crop this year on your side of the hill. As you can see, it's a powerful big crop of corn. And don't you worry, we aim to fill your corn crib plumb to the top as a thank you. Granny Moses slowly turned to the sled, full of corn. She picked up an ear in her hands, and she examined it. Suddenly, she broke the thick silence with these words. If you eat a single bite of this corn, your family will forever be cursed, and you will have given life to the darkness that is laid dormant in this soul, just waiting for fools such as you to come along. I've seen it with my own eyes once before, and I know this ground is cursed. Do not eat it. You have been warned. And with that, the old lady slowly turned and disappeared into the morning fog, into the thickness of the corn patch. And as it turns out, this would be the last time they would ever see her again. But as fate would have it, her words would live on much longer than any of the Seibert family could have ever imagined. And so it was, for nearly 150 years, each successive generation of the Seibert family called this place home. And while the population down in the mountain valley grew, there remained but just a few of the hardiest families, living high among the steep ridges. This was the world that Bertha Seibert was born into during the fall of 1929. Just like all her family that came before her, she was born in that old three-room cabin that her great-grandparents had built. Bertha was a curious little girl with golden blonde hair, blue eyes, and pink cheeks. She was the oldest of four siblings and a hard worker. Like all mountain children, she spent most of her time helping out on the family farm. Bertha loved visiting all of her relatives who lived on Powell Mountain, especially her grandma and her grandpa who still lived in the ancestral cabin. It seemed like every time she'd visit her papa, he would have a new corn cob doll made for her. She'd sit on the porch and play with her doll as the old man told stories that happened long ago on the mountain. Bertha liked it when he told her spooky stories and she would always beg him to tell another. And by the time she went home, 
She'd be so scared she'd run down that mountain so fast that all you could see was a trail of dust flying from her bare feet. By the year 1939, Bertha was nine years old and in the second grade. Each day she led her younger siblings down the mountain to the one-room schoolhouse in the valley. All of the kids loved going to school since it was the only time they ever had a chance to see any other kids that weren't their kinfolk. Bertha was one of the most popular girls and was deemed to be a good speller by her teacher. It seemed that the young girl was living a simple, good life surrounded by her family and friends. Early one morning, Bertha awoke to a loud commotion, and as the young girl peeked down the ladder that led from the bedroom loft, she heard her paw say that Grandpa had taken ill and was powerful sick. They didn't even know if he'd make it through the day. Within minutes, Bertha, her ma and Paul, and all her siblings made the steep climb up to the old man's cabin, and he held a vigil for the next 48 hours, sitting with him beside his bed as he slowly got weaker and weaker. Everybody took turns sitting at his bed nonstop. On the second night, as young Bertha held onto her grandpa's hand, he opened up his eyes for the first time in over a day. The weak old man slowly turned his head and smiled at his granddaughter. Come closer, my sweet child. I, I have one last story for you. He began, when I was a little boy about your age, my great-grandfather told me a story that had been passed down to him by his great-grandfather a story that he had never shared with anyone before until he passed it down to me. Now, I must warn you, I've never told this story to anyone since my grandpap told me, and I swore to him I would keep it a secret, but I can't let it die with me. I'm listening, Papa, the young girl said. Long, long ago, something evil happened on this mountain. Long before the white man ever arrived here, the natives, they knew about it. And they believed this mountain was cursed. For many years, no one dared to live on this mountain, except an old Loundon witch. No one knows for sure how she did it. But somehow, the witch survived on this mountain without ever eating anything that grew here. She was only seen in the shadows until one day, our ancestors settled on this mountain. The legends passed down by my great grandpa say that many of our family suffered strange visitations, things that couldn't be explained. Some say that folks were possessed by dark forces. The Grandpa, you know that ain't true. The girl interrupted. The old man smiled, and with what little strength he had left, he let out a weak, faint laugh. <laughs> oh, my child, you'll see. <laughs> you'll see. And with that, the old man died. After her grandpa died, Bertha moved into the old cabin with her grandma to help out. There was only one bedroom in the cabin, and the young mountain child shared the bed with her grandmother. By fall, the family began bringing the corn harvest in for the year, when Bertha began to have strange visions. Each night as she slept, she kept seeing an old woman's face. The old woman was smiling and would reach out her hand for the child. When Bertha would suddenly wake up from the bed, startling her grandmother, who was sleeping beside her. Gal, what's gotten into you? The old woman asked. I'm seeing things that ain't there, Grandma. Some lady's reaching for me when I sleep, Bertha replied. Youngin, there ain't no haints in here, and I got a Bible laying on the table right next to you. There ain't nothing to be afeard of. Yes, Grandma, the child answered as she glanced over towards the old Bible, taking a bit of assurance that possibly it might protect her from her dreams. The next night... Bertha lied awake as her grandmother slept beside her. A strange sensation fell upon her. She had an eerie feeling that something was in the room. Her heart was racing and her palms began to sweat as she gripped the old homemade quilt tightly. Suddenly, the cabin floor began creaking. As if something was walking towards her, the frightened child pulled the covers over her head as the creaking grew closer and closer. Out of nowhere, the sound stopped. What was it? Was it gone? Slowly, she began to pull the covers down and try to peek out. When out of nowhere, something ripped the sheets off the bed 
Bertha screamed at the top of her lungs. And there it was, an old lady hovered above the bed, and she breathed something into the young girl's face. Both the grandmother and the child flew from the bed. What was that? What's wrong with you? The old lady yelled. Grandma, did you see it? Did you see it? It was right above me. Gal, what in tarnation put such foolishness in your mind? All I saw was you pull the sheets right off of me and wake me up. Now I'm warning you, I'm going to put you on the floor if you don't stop this foolishness. You hear me? The traditions of the mountains demanded that the young girl obey her grandmother and not question her judgment. So Bertha yielded without protest, terrified. She remained eyes open wide until the sun rose the next morning. The next night, Bertha was completely exhausted. Oh, she hadn't slept in days. She laid down early that night, and the old mountain woman watched as her grandchild fell fast asleep. And then she slipped into the kitchen to finish cleaning up the supper dishes. After a while, she went outside to make sure the smokehouse door was shut good to keep the animals out. The signs of the moon and the clouds in the sky forebode that the coming winter was shaping up to be one of the harshest in years. Last thing they needed was to lose the meat from last week's hog killing. It was all they'd have to make it through the winter. As she approached the smokehouse, she heard something on the wind, some animal-type sound. She stopped for a moment and listened. There it was again, some gnawing sound. What was it? It was hard to tell where it was coming from. It grew louder the sound of gnawing and scratching, and a striking metal sound. She turned and looked back towards the cabin, when suddenly, Bertha screamed. <coughs> Frantically, the old woman picked up an ax that was leaning against the smokehouse, and she moved as quickly as her old bones would let her. Hold on, youngin, I'm coming, hold on. The sounds grew louder as she approached the porch. As she threw the front door open, she felt the entire cabin floor violently shaken, and a thundering sound coming from the bedroom. Bertha's screams were combined with an animalistic fury. As Granny made it to the bedroom, the door wasn't locked, but something was holding it shut, pulling back as the old woman struggled to open the door. Pictures were swaying back and forth on the living room walls. A gust of wind poured into the room, so strong it blew out the flames in the fireplace. Granny picked up the axe and she began swinging at the bedroom door. Over and over until the door split open. And as she peered into the bedroom, she couldn't believe her eyes. The entire 200 pound oak bed was bouncing completely off the floor as the 60 pound girl was tossed back and forth, screaming for her life. Granny looked up at the headboard, and there she saw two hands that weren't human, firmly gripped on the bedpost, violently shaking the bed. The young girl was thrown completely off the bed, where she hit her head on the bedside table and was rendered unconscious, with the Bible falling from the table beside the little girl. And in that instant, a thunderous evil scream came from the bed, so loud that it echoed through the hollers surrounding the homestead. All at once, the room went completely black and silent. Granny dropped her axe and fell to her knees. My God, what was that? By the next day, wagon tongues had spread the story all over Powell Mountain and down into Jonesville. You see, superstitions, the belief in the unexplained, and supernatural events ran strong in the mountain folk. Bertha's father relayed the event to the Baptist preacher in great detail. And within hours, the preacher and two deacons from the church made the steep climb up the mountain to the rustic cabin where they found the young girl sitting in a split-bottom chair in the kitchen, smiling as if nothing had happened. The preacher immediately said that he felt an evil presence in the room and he took out a cross from around his neck and attempted to place it on the young girl's forehead. When out of nowhere, 
the chair flew backwards nearly four feet across the room. And a cold chill suddenly filled the air. Bertha calmly looked on and smiled at the men. My God, Brother John, did you see that? The terrified father said as his voice was shaken. I'm afraid it's worse than I feared, the preacher replied as he slowly walked backwards away from the smiling child. It's going to take all of God's children to stand up and drive this demon out. And with that, the elders of the church left to gather up the entire church body. Their plan was to return at sunset, each person armed with a Bible and the Word of God. Surely, this would drive the spirit out of Bertha. That afternoon, there were nearly a score of horses and several wagons at the bottom of the mountain, and nearly 60 people climbed to the top to confront the darkness that had taken over the nine-year-old girl. Most folks still had doubts as to if the rumors were really true. Did the bed really bounce off the floor? Was there really poltergeist activity in that cabin? So far, the grandmother was the only one who had witnessed the majority of the paranormal activity. Maybe the chair had simply slipped across the kitchen. Folks just didn't know what to expect. Once they reached the top of the mountain, one by one, they entered the three-room cabin, led by the preacher. The grandmother met them at the door. She's in the bed. She's sleeping and everything seems okay. Can't we just let her be? I'm afeard not, the preacher replied. We can't allow the darkness to dwell inside this child for another minute. And with that, the entire church body began singing hymns, filling the small bedroom until the crowd spilled over into the living room and on the porch looking through the window. Slowly, Bertha opened her eyes. And the preacher began, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, we rebuke you, Satan. We command you to flee from the child and vacate this home. The faithful continued singing, many thrusting their Bibles towards a small child, whose father was standing next to her, encouraging her. Fight with everything you have, Bertha. Yet, everyone in the room could feel the sudden temperature change, and heard the gnawing sounds coming from the bed, and slowly... The mattress started moving up and down. The gnawing and clashing, grinding sounds of the metal box springs filled the room. Bertha's head turned towards her father, and she began speaking in some tongue that no one could understand. Fight, Bertha! Fight it, gal! Her father replied. But by now, the entire bed was bouncing off the floor when four stout miners grabbed a hold of each bedpost and attempted to hold it down to the ground. Each man weighed nearly 200 pounds, yet they couldn't stop the bouncing bed. Stunned and terrified, the crowd began pressing backwards, and folks began to fight their way out the front door of the cabin. No one had ever seen anything like this. Everyone who was in attendance was convinced that what they witnessed was not of this world. By the next day, the sheriff had an emergency meeting with the county commissioners. Indeed, Everyone in the town was talking about the mountain girl that folks were now referring to as Bouncing Bertha. The sensational story began to travel across state lines, and it caught the attention of two professors from the University of Tennessee who decided to make the pilgrimage to Bertha's cabin and study the phenomenon for themselves. The night the professors arrived, the grandmother made them supper, and as they were eating dinner, out of nowhere, all the meat flew off their plates and flew across the room, and their bowls of soup all turned over. Later, just like every night before, Bertha's bed continued to bounce uncontrollably. Having seen enough, the professors promptly hurried out of the cabin. However, being men of education and firm believers in science, all they would comment at the time was that the events were peculiar and they were reported to have said they needed to hurry back to Tennessee to examine the evidence. That event sparked national interest and soon the story of bouncing Bertha was front page news and the talk of every radio station all across America. Once two college doctors came from Tennessee to visit Bertha's family, writing down all they had seen. While they ate their dinner, the meat flew from their plates. The soup tureen turned over, and they noted that was strange. And she cried when she tried to sleep. That's when that white fuzzy spirit started to creep There she lay when people came To watch that child's bed hop bounce and Bertha was her name For 19 straight nights, the paranormal activity that possessed young Bertha continued. 
Her father decided to get the girl away from the cabin in an attempt to solve the riddle. He had her spend the night at her cousin's house nearly two miles away. Yet, the bed continued to bounce. Bertha's grandmother would tell anyone who would listen that this was the work of a mountain witch. They tried everything. They put a silver coin under her pillow. They shot her picture with a silver bullet. Yet, the phenomenon continued. The only thing that seemed to slow down the spirit was when a Bible was placed under Bertha's head. All told, young Bertha was visited by some unknown spirit for 35 straight nights. The story captivated the nation, and everybody had an opinion. Folks traveled from all over America to Bertha's small cabin to witness the event. At the time, the most famous magician in the world was Houdini, and his wife was set to make the journey there in an attempt to prove that the events weren't real. In one of the more curious events, the two University of Tennessee professors that were in such a hurry to get out of that cabin as fast as they could so that they could, quote-unquote, examine the evidence, suddenly signed an agreement with a prominent scientific journal where they were paid to write an article stating that the entire events were fake. Their copyrighted results were then sold to newspapers all across America. That was enough to convince most folks across America that the events suddenly weren't real. But for the mountain folks who witnessed it, no, they knew better. There's some things in these mountains that science would never be able to explain, let alone two book-educated college professors that were paid to publish their findings. Bertha finally moved away from her grandmother's, and she lived with another family member to escape the nonstop press. Still, folks continued to flock to the cabin, where her grandmother swore to her dying day to anybody that would listen that what she saw was not of this world and was flat-out witchery. Bertha herself never publicly commented on these events for the rest of her life. It seems she didn't want to breathe life into whatever it was again. How about you? Do you think it was real or a hoax? Did the mountain witch curse that family? Was it a Native American curse? Let me know in the comments below. Till next time, my friends. Little Bertha Cyber weighed only 60 pounds. But every night before she slept, she bounced plumb off the ground. And she cried when she tried to sleep. That's when that white fuzzy spirit started to creep. So there she lay when people came. Watch that child's bed, hot bouncing Bertha was her name.